Hi, Mary Beth. Hi, Carlotta. Nice to meet you virtually. We met briefly March 2019. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, but hey. yeah, it is nice to meet you too. It's been a while. It feels like years now, decades. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess, do you, would you like to get started? To give everybody no, it's noon right now, so. Yep. Can you put your... All right, so um, Dr. Carlotta Chief will um, be will enter, will start us off since we are at time. And you're on mute, Carlotta. Okay, are we ready to get started? Yes, let's get started. Okay. Welcome everyone Yate, to all the attendees of this webinar. Uh, this is a webinar entitled Indigenous Food Sovereignty and Contaminants Perspectives from the US, specifically from Southwest and the Arctic. This webinar is uh, sponsored by the Indigenous Food Knowledges Network, the Superfund Research Program at the University of Arizona <clears throat> and the Center for Indigenous Environmental Health Research. And my name is uh, Dr. Carletta Chief. I am an Associate Professor in Environmental Science and I am the PI of the Superfund Research Program Community Engagement Corps along with Dr. Stephanie Carol. Our speakers here today are Dr. Janie C. Ingram, who's an associate professor at Northern Arizona University, and Anuk Yak Sudolovanik, who is a PhD student at the University of Manitoba. At this time, I want to welcome each and every one of you, and I hope you are all doing well, safe, and healthy. I'd like to allow um, the director of the co-lead of the Indigenous Food Knowledge Network and Research to do the introductions for our speaker. And that will be Mary Beth Jager. Ahead. All right, Miigwech, Dr. Chief. Um, Bojo, I'm Mary Beth Jager. I am a citizen of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, Chicana and German descent. I am a research analyst at the Native Nations Institute at the University of Arizona. I am, as um, Dr. Chief mentioned, a uh, co-lead for the Indigenous Foods Knowledges Network. And welcome, I'm glad to have you all here today. And I also would like to take a moment to um, just acknowledge the homelands. I'm on the Salish, the Puget Salish, and the uh, Snohomish, Snohomish and Duwamish peoples up here in the Seattle area. I've actually been telecommuting for eight years now um, before it became one of the big things to do. So um, I wanna just take a moment so that we all, can not you don't have to do out loud, but just to acknowledge where we all are, the people's lands that we all are on in this moment together. And also because today is the first day of fall. And so uh, we all celebrate it, I know in different ways. I know it's an important season for many of us native people. And so just take a, just a moment. All right, um, I'd like to introduce our speakers. I'm very excited to have them here today with us. Um, so we have, um, so going first is going to be Inu. Inu, I've been working really hard, getting close, I'm trying really hard, is a PhD student in environment and geography at the University of Manitoba, where she is studying the health of marine mammals through pathology and exposure to pollutants. She has a master's in science in veterinary medicine from the University of Prince Edward Island. Inu was born in and raised in the Pond Inlet and Inklet um, Nuviant and brings together Western science and Inuit uh, knowledge together in her research. And then 
Jani is a PhD, she says a PhD investigates environmental contaminants with respect to their impact on health. A major part of her research is focused on characterizing uranium and arsenic contamination in water, soil, plants, and livestock. A critical aspect of her research is to foster collaborations with the Native American community and leaders to build trust, obtain access to field samples, and gain insights into their health concerns. She is a member of the Navajo Nation. And so this, so they're both going to present, and then we'll do questions at the end. We'll leave about 15 minutes. So please hold your questions. Um, you either can ask them in person or you can drop them in the chat. So we'll take it away in you, please. Awesome. Kuyanami Mary Beth and Dr. Carlotta Chief uh, for the intro. I'm just going to share my screen here and if you can let me know if you once you see it. Um, is it visible? It is visible. Okay, thank you. Full screen. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm Inuya Sedevinak, um, but you can call me Inu. I'm currently a PhD student at University of Manitoba, and um, I'm going to be presenting the work that I did for my master's which was on ring seals up in Nunavut, uh, Northern Canada. And um, that's why you see both logos there. I'm currently at University of Manitoba, but this work was done at UPEI. And um, so I'll be talking about mixed methods, uh, indigenous and Western science in assessing ring seal health. Oh no, now I won't let me scroll. Sorry, let me figure this out. Usually you can scroll. Okay, what's going on here? Hmm. Oh, oh, okay, there we go. Um, so we've moved, there's, we're in the middle of a paradigm shift where research used to be on or about Indigenous peoples. Now we're moving more towards where research is for and with Indigenous peoples or even by Indigenous peoples, which is awesome. Um, and in a lot of cases, Indigenous and Western methodologies do exist separately. Um, there's a lot of new and up and coming literature out there, some cool papers and books coming out where there are examples of um, braiding the two knowledges together. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard of like breeding sweetgrass. Um, that's a really good example. And um, so I, tr I was learning how to do this in my master's. Um, and there were something there. Are, I learned a lot of things. Um, and that's, you'll see some of that during this presentation. Um, but I forgot to mention yet. Yeah, so I'm, I'm from Nunavut, um, which is Northeast Canada. And it's about 90% of the population are Inuit. Um, so we still do a lot of um, harvesting marine mammals and like hunting and camping and all that awesome stuff. Um, just a bit of context on this research. Um, but there, as um, someone who did my undergrad in marine biology, I didn't do that much social science stuff. But I learned a lot, a lot in my master's and the difference between methodology, like theory behind stuff, why you're doing it, which populations versus methods, the stuff that you're writing in your papers, like exact how you did it. And I really like to emphasize how, why methodology is so important. And um, in indigenous methodologies, uh, process is way more important than the actual work itself in a lot of the time. So how you're doing the work is really important. How you're interacting with people is really important. Yes, the results are also important, but process will determine how your work tur ends or turn turns out in the end. And um, there's a I like this quote from uh, Dr. Kolchiski from here at U of M. Uh, Northern research involves a twofold responsibility, meeting the demands of academic community and the demands of the Aboriginal or Indigenous communities. And um, that, 
I feel like that really nicely captures um, where we're at right now with Indigenous scholars coming up through academia and um, it's kind of a fine balance sometimes. So this project is mixed methods in two senses. And the first sense is that it's Western and Indigenous methods, methodologies, and also it's quantitative, uh, quantitative and qualitative. So I looked at serology or um, blood um, in the ring seals and Inuit Kauyume Tohangit, or I'll refer it to as IQ because it's really long, um, but Inuit Kauyume Tohangit is um, Inuit knowledges, but it's more than that in that it includes a lot of the values and teachings of um, Inuit worldview. So it's kind of a huge term that encapsulates a lot of things. Um, but if you're working in Nunavut, people prefer to use this term instead of Indigenous knowledge or Inuit knowledge, um, just because it includes so many other things and makes it more wholesome. So how, this is this methodology perspective, how my data was collected, which population and when and how invasive is it? These three things are the most important things to consider when you're working in the North, particularly in Nunavut and with, um, or throughout uh, Northern Canada, Greenland, Alaska. Um, and I will answer those in the next slide. But why I used mixed methods is because it's, you get a better understanding of the research uh, and the research question. Um, it does offset the weaknesses of each method. So um, if Western science is not very good at placing context with your results, then that's where your IQ can come in and inform the applicability of those results. Um, so they really offset each other's weaknesses. And it's a great approach to complex questions, which in most times, if you're dealing with animals, it's super complex. There's a lot of different factors. And um, combine, combining numbers and text, it helps bridge gap between research and practice. Um, so it, there's a lot of numbers with the serology results, with the blood work, and finding out what that means in the end was really cool. Um, and you'll see that uh, in a couple slides where I have the results. So the question, um, this is kind of how I came up with my question for my master's. Um, so you have one side, you have Inuit needs, and on the other side, you have scientific curiosity. So um, coming up with questions, it's really important to listen. Um, I'm from Nunavut, so, and, uh, so I'm from Nunavut and I grew up like hunting all the time and camping. Um, so you got to listen to what people are saying. You got to ask some questions. Um, we have ITK, which is Inuit Debris Canada Me, which represents all the Inuit in Canada. So they're a really great organization. Um, and also look at regional org organizations. But you also need to, on the scientific curiosity side, you need to question who does this research benefit? Um, so if there's a question, if you have a question on um, where are these seals going, then science can find, find out the finer details, like exactly when and where, and they can make suggestions on methodologies. So my question was, is ring seal safe to eat? And here you can see a picture of a community feast. Um, I think that's in Nunavik, so Northern Quebec. Um, so ring seal, like everyone's eating ring seal. Um, I eat a lot of ring seal when I go home. It's harder to get in southern Canada, um, but that was the question. And so why ring seals? So it is a country food, um, or you might know as traditional food. People are eating all the time, but it's also a great marine indicator because ring seals are the only seals that stay around when the ocean freezes completely over. So these guys can bore holes into the ice so that they can breathe. So other seals like harp seals will um, follow the open water. So they leave for the winter when there's, um, when the ice freezes over, which is like seven months of the year. And as you can see in this picture, uh, this is one hunter. He went out for one day and that's how many seals he caught. So like 
it's you get a really nice sample range and all of it like was given out to his family members he had, he had a huge family um so yeah ring seals are a really good marine indicator and so just a little bit of context is where this was um it was in iqalit uh, which is the capital of nunavut and it was spring and fall of 2017 and 2018 that was when um, I got to go home and sample seals. So the goal was to enhance the knowledge on health of the harvested nutdiq, or ring seal, within Frobisher Bay through context given by IQ. And how did I do that? So um, my IQ, I did nine interviews with nine semi-structured questions on ring seal observations with um, super experienced Hunter, hunters and um, there were I, I interviewed one of the hunters wise because she did a lot of um, like seal processing and for the serology side I looked at those different bacteria um, in this in the serum so in that in the vials there you, you see the serum on the top so um, I looked at the harvested population only there were some questions of people being like, okay, you don't have a representative sample of all the seals. That's true, but we have the ones that people are selectively choosing and hunters always, always choose a specific group of seals, just as hunters um, who are hunting deer, well, they always want the big buck, right? So with us, um, the Inuit prefer the smaller seals. So it's a very select group of seals that people are choosing and it, like I said, it was spring and fall. And since these were harvested seals already, we just sampled what they had. So it was like not invasive of live seals. Um, I won't get in this too much just because of time. Um, that's, that's just the methods. So I'll go into the results of these methods. But I did use Envivo and um, there were... Yes, there were interviews were in Inuktitut and English, and I did all the interviews, and I translated everything into English. So in the end, we did find really cool results. Six main themes. Like I said, all the hunters prefer young seals um, every time. There's a big seal on the ice, and you see a big one and a small one next to it. They're always going to go for the little one. Um, they have not noticed a decline in ring seals over time and uh, they noticed harp seals. So my work was on ring seals, but every time I talk with the hunters, they always made a mention of harp seals and how they're increasing in number a lot, that they're getting to be problematic. Um, and I'll get, that, get more into that in a second. Um, we talked about how they um, inspect seals when they catch them, like which ones they reject, which ones they keep, what illness looks like in seals for them, and which parts they eat and how. So there was a lot of really cool information um, that we got, but the harp seals was a big concern um, that the hunters had. So there are a couple quotes here where they're just talking about how Every year there's more and more thousands and hundreds and thousands of these harp seals coming up and taking over the ring seal territory. So if you're going out hunting, you're going to see way, way, way more harp seals than ring seals. And that's becoming a concern for Inuit hunters. So um, like I said, process is more important. So we had communication open the whole time and that was a bit easier because like I grew up in Iqaluit, I know all the hunters, I know everybody there. So we had, we were talking the whole time. But for the results, I made a YouTube video in Inuktitut with English subtitles to kind of circulate the results. And um, it ended up being seen uh, in other communities and they were like, oh, you should do research in our community too, uh, which was awesome. Like they're, everyone, like people are interested um, which is great considering that um, science doesn't typically have a great reputation um, in Inuit communities. Um, so we disseminated the results and it was really fun. Um, hunters were super keen to find out what they were. And 
Um, we didn't find anything scary with regards to the ser serology results. Um, so I, yeah, nothing, nothing scary. That's what we told her. I, I'm still going to keep eating seal, which is the, the main takeaway. Um, and so the conclusions that I have quickly are uh, methodology is really important. Um, mixed methods are great because it, it for us, uh, the future, the, the the takeaway we got was that people want more research on harp seals because they're just going to be so many. So that's a new direction for research to go if anybody wants to keep doing seal work. And communication, um, as we all know, is super key. And um, yeah, there's benefits and risks to consuming ring seal. Like if you're a pregnant woman, you shouldn't eat the liver of the seal just because of the amount of mercury that's in there. Um, and that's been... That's actually more well known in Nunavik, Northern Ontario, or Quebec, rather than Nunavut, um, which th they have different health departments, so they deal with their information differently. Um, but the takeaway is there's a lot of benefits to consuming ring seal. Um, just be careful if you're pregnant to eat um, certain parts of the seal. Um, but that's it. Thanks for listening. I, I tried to keep it in time. I think I did. Um, and thanks to all the sponsors here. We have Native Wildlife Manager Board, uh, Garfield Weston, and uh, Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative. Um, and my mom like sampled all the, all the seals with me. <laughs> so I put her name there because she did so much work. Um, but yeah, thanks for listening. Okay, I'm going to stop right, Rikulich and now. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Dr. Ingram. Right. Yate. Um, Shay, Jani Ingram. You should be seeing a traditional Navajo food studies first slide, I hope. Yes. Um, it's, thank you. And, and thank you to um, Mary Beth and to Bo and to Carletta and Stephanie for this opportunity to share with you some of the science out of my lab. Um, I am a member of the Diné or the Navajo Nation on my mom's side. Uh, my maternal clan is the uh, Nanesh Deji and my paternal clan is um, Kinlachi and then my dad is Bilagana or white man. Um, so it's great to be here. I'm from uh, Northern Arizona University and I'm going to talk to you just a small portion of some of the science that we do in my lab. So, um, so overall, we, uh, our lab, I'm an analytical chemist by training actually from the University of Arizona, go Wildcats. Um, but I, the work that we do, I consider to be environmental health, where we work with a lot of different folks because it is a very big and interdisciplinary type of approach. And for the most part, we look at um, contaminants, environmental elemental contaminants, particularly uranium and arsenic, but we've looked at other things as well. And we do a lot of field work looking at water and soil plants and crops, and then I'm going to focus on um, livestock today, but all looking at the impact on um, the Navajo people. So this, if you're not familiar, is a map of the Navajo Nation. Um, it's um, located in the states of Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. Um, the sort of smaller lines inside of the, the, na the nation are chapters or communities. Um, and then as you can see, the Hopi Nation is also within the boundaries of the Navajo Nation. Um, what you're looking at here is a map made by my student, or my former student, now Dr. Tommy Rock, um, that tries to show you where some of the uranium mining took place back in the middle 1900s. Those um, triangles are the old uranium mine features. The circles with the dots are known um, contaminated wells, which we've done a lot of water work as well. And then um, specifically today, I'm gonna talk about some data that we've collected in um, the Western part of Navajo Nation, which would be in the communities of Cameron and Loop. And then a more recent study that we've been working on in the Cove area. 
So just a little background, um, uranium mining, like I said, out on the Colorado Plateau and specifically on Navajo um, took place in the mid 1900s. Um, there was quite a few um, mine attempts anyway, over a thousand. And right now there's like 532, I think, um, um, actual old mine sites on the Navajo Nation. Um, there was different approaches to the mining. Some was underground, which is shown in that picture, but also there was um, open pit mining, um, particularly in the western side of Navajo. So as a result of all this mining, there wasn't a lot of remediation, so left behind um, a lot of waste. And this has been an ongoing uh, concern to the Navajo people. Um, why do we care about this? Well, these contaminants, particularly, as I said, uranium and arsenic, um, do pro are, are um, part of an exposure to the people that live on the nation. Um, I'm going to focus today on ingestion or in terms of um, exposure through food, but we've also looked at water, um, not done a lot of work with dust. The other thing is that there's been studies looking at acute exposure, so really intense exposure at one time, but really where people I think are more apt to be exposed is through a long-term um, chronic exposure. So in order to do this work, um, we definitely are looking to get um, partnerships with the Navajo Nation. And so um, on Navajo, you get what's called a resolution, which essentially is an approval for your research. And this is something that you go to either the community or in this case, we, um, uh, this picture is my former student, Lindsay Jones, presenting at Western Agency back in 2018. And really essentially presenting your project and um, the entire community gets to vote yay or nay. Okay, so I think it's a really important part of, of doing research because there's not only just getting the approval, but really those interactions and the dissemination over time. Um, I guess I can turn my video on again. All right, so the goals, the big goals of my lab is really to look at these environmental contaminants and with context um, on Navajo. But we also are very interested in trying to look at this multidisciplinary approach. So like I said, we work with all kinds of different folks from different backgrounds, including um, tribal leaders and community folks. Um, we also are, um, one of my dearest, most passionate things in life is working with students and in particular Native American students and um, just being a part of their um, development as scientists. So um, our collaborators are many. Like I said, this is sort of a multidisciplinary approach. Um, some of the most important collaborators really are my students and their families. It has opened our doors to looking at different issues in different communities on Navajo. Um, and we work with um, the community leaders as well as tribal leaders, some of the government entities, EPA, natural resources. Um, you'll see that I have um, some work that um, is human research, so we uh, have approvals through the Navajo Institutional Review Board. Very important to know what other people are doing out on Navajo. Um, some of you are on this call, so yay. And then, like I said, lots of different scientists that we work with. So I'm going to focus um, on two different projects within my lab, and the first one is looking at uranium in um, the traditional Navajo food mutton. So what you're looking at is a piece of fried bread and uh, mutton stew. So um, if you're not familiar with the Navajo traditions, um, the sheep are extremely important to the Navajo. Um, they were introduced, as it says, in the 1600s and um, the Navajos really became more um, um, ranchers and, and, and you can see a picture of folks raising sheep there. Um, it really is more than just an animal. There is definitely a lot of cultural significance. Um, having some mutton is not just like having a burger. So the, the issue of, of contamination within the, the um, sheep that are being raised on Navajo is very important. 
And part of the reason we got into this research was that we had community members asking this question to us over and over. And finally, we had the opportunity to sort of delve into this with some EPA um, funding and then more recently with the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences out of NIH. So our focus is really to quantify the uranium in sheep and not just in the sheep, but in different pieces and parts of the sheep, um, because um, we are interested in trying to help people know maybe a, a specific organ or tissue has higher levels than another. So maybe to stay away from those. We've also worked with the Swinomish tribe in looking at using their indigenous health indicator to really look at the health impact. We're still working through that. And then, you know, really what are those uranium exposures? So what you're seeing to the, um, the right side of the, the, the slide is a map. Again, Navajo Nation shown here. Flagstaff, where I'm located, is about right here. So we collected sheep from Cameron, which is the black dots, from Loop, which is the red dots. And then we looked at this site far off of the Navajo Nation, and you'll see in a few moments why that was in Eager. And then more recently, we've been up here doing sampling in the Cove area. And the yellow dots is, um, are trying to indicate the abandoned mine sites. So you can see there was a lot of mining in the Cameron area, seemingly none in the Loop area, and then a lot in the Cove area. Cove really was underground mining, and then Cameron really was on um, the, the open pit mining. So in order to do this work, we definitely worked a lot with our community folks. And so um, during our sample collection, really, we called it a butchering party. So we would go and <clears throat> we have um, statistically determined that five sheep from a flock is fairly representative. And so um, it took an army of students really to go out and to collect the um, list of tissues and organs that are shown there. Um, and so actually, I think someone on the line, this is Marsha Bitsui right here, one of my former students. But um, this was something that we did with with all of the the collection was it really was a um, a partnership with the community folks so i'm just going to cut to the chase and that is looking at some of our results so these are results from um, comparing sheep collected in cameron which again there was the open pit mining to Loop, which is also in Western Navajo, but there was no mining there. And then to this off-reservation site in Eager. This is a, a average of five sheep, um, and we're looking at the kidneys. And so what you see is actually um, higher levels in both Cameron and Loop, and then the lower levels in Eager. So initially, we were going to use Loop as our control site, but when we got the results back for pretty much all the different tissues and organs that we looked at, the levels in Cameron and Loop were very similar. Now we don't know what's background or normal um, because those numbers are just not available. And so then we have the question, well, is this just background levels? And so that really isn't an effect or is actually loops seeing elevated levels even though there was no mining in that area. So that's what motivated us to get five sheep in the eager area. And as you can say, see, it is um, factors of, of a couple to three or four times lower. And so it does seem that there is some additional or there's some uranium in these loop sheep. Now, it turned out that we found out there's a lot of um, sheep trading and we didn't know exactly what areas the, the animals were um, grazing in loop. And so then the follow on study actually was to look at sheep in Cove. That study is ongoing right now, but that study is a partnership with the University of New Mexico with Montana State University Billings and with the Neck College with the Neck College being the lead. And um, that project, we're not only collecting um, livestock, we're also collecting environmental samples. But the important thing is that we are actually um, collaring animals in order to do a GPS um, tracking of where they are grazing so that we can pull environmental samples exactly in those areas. So um, that, like I said, that 
study right now is ongoing. We hope to be a little bit further along, but COVID sort of put a kibosh on some of our, our co sample collection last spring. But what you're looking at here is just comparing um, the COVE information that we have to date, which is a one goat and a couple um, sheep. This is the, the backbone meat on the animals. Then we compare it to Eager, Cameron, and Loop. And we do see actually a quite a bit lower level in COVE. I'm pretty careful, cautious in trying to show that now because like I said, we need to do a lot more work um, to see if that's true. This could potentially be part because um, there was underground mining here and in particular Cameron, it was open pit mining. So it's a little bit uh, more exposed, but we, we are still trying to understand that. So one of the other things that we did part of the study talking about a scientist trying to do social science is we wanted to know how much people were actually eating of mutton. And so um, again, my former student now, Dr. Tommy Rock, as part of his dissertation work, he did a um, survey of folks in Cameron looking at their consumption um, behaviors. So we had to have a lot of um, approvals in order to do this um, human research. But what we found was he surveyed 72 people. The demographics are shown here. We had a pretty good representation from young to old with, with the most folks being between 40 and 70 years of age. Um, it, the folks were not all exactly in Cameron because what Tommy did was he went to events that were held in Cameron and sometimes there would be other folks present at those events. But um, overall, I think he got a pretty good feel for the, um, the, the mutton consumption um, behaviors there in Cameron. And what we saw was that um, people don't eat as much mutton as they used to. They, it's mostly at family gatherings, so maybe monthly um, or, or a little bit more often. Definitely older folks eat more mutton than younger folks. Um, but people were very stated that the mutton um, was very important in their traditions and they really wanted to be able to continue um, being able to eat mutton. So what we have done recently is actually did this same survey in the Cove area. Cove is about the same size of a community as Cameron, except it's on the east and in, in the northeast. So we're going to be comparing those, um, those results and really trying to get a better feel for um, mutton consumption uh, across the Navajo Nation. So the other study I wanted to just briefly talk about is um, one that was done by a student named Daniel Begay looking at calcium and blue corn mush. So that's a picture of blue corn mush there. Um, Juniper ash is added to a lot of Navajo, traditional Navajo foods. It um, seems to be a potential source for calcium for folks. There was a previous study looking at fractures in elderly Navajo, which was much lower than in Caucasian women. And so it was hypothesized that because a lot of elderly Navajos eat um, blue corn mush almost on a daily basis, this could be a very good source of calcium. So we wanted to investigate um, if the juniper ash was what was adding calcium to the diet. So his work was to quantify calcium. He bought juniper ash at flea markets, but we also um, collected juniper and he ashed them both in, in a couple different ways, doing um, using a, a, a furnace. And then also he learned how to do traditional ashing. So this is just pictures of putting the ash. This is after it came out of the furnace, it was nice and white. And then he actually learned from a couple grandmas how to um, burn the ash in order to, or burn the juniper in order to get the ash. So these were some of the sites he collected his juniper. Part of we were in, thing we were interested in was were certain areas higher in calcium than others? And so what we found is shown here is these are all these different samples and essentially there is some variation, but for the most part, it's 250 milligrams per gram plus or minus about 50. You can see that his laboratory ash seems to have higher concentrations than the traditional. However, if we look at looking at his juniper ash that he got from the flea markets, it's also fairly high, 250 to 300. Um, and so that 
the good news there is that we think that um, that, that you really don't need to go to a certain area of the Navajo Nation to collect your juniper to get good calcium concentration in your ash. The other thing is um, Daniel himself thought that he probably didn't do the traditional ashing as well as probably one of the grandmas, so that might be why his laboratory ashing was higher. Um, what we want to do next, I have another student who's going to actually look at calcium in um, a few different sources of blue corn that people use. Since most of the blue corn mush is blue corn, it would be useful to know how much calcium is coming from the blue corn. And we um, are in the midst of collecting that, those results in order to publish these results. And then the last thing I'm going to just refer to very quickly is that um, super important is dissemination and then also some of the work we've done in policy. So these are pictures of um, folks from Cameron who came to visit our lab. This is my former student Tommy Rock who invited them and we gave them a, a, a lab tour and have a, had a discussion. This is my other student, current doctoral student Andy Lister in with the instruments kind of trying to explain how we go about doing our science. Um, then Tommy also got funding in order to actually put on a series of conferences with respect to uranium issues out on Navajo, and he held four different uh, meetings. As you can see here, this is a picture of some of the folks in my group with, in Cameron with um, State Representative Peshlakai during one of those meetings. Um, we also have been called upon by different political folks in order to either provide our insights um, during, in this case, it was um, Representative Tom O'Halloran and he was having a town hall in Cameron. And so shown down here at the table is one of my former students, um, Jonathan Credo, providing some background information on our work. So um, I'm going to leave it there. Um, we have, like I said, lots of help um, from different folks and the funding agencies, um, EPA and NIEHS have been very generous. We also want to thank our collaborators in Cameron Cove and Loop. Um, we've done some work, particularly Tommy, with working with the Diné Hatapli Association, which is the Medicine Man, Medicine Man Association, in terms of <clears throat> thinking about how to do this work um, culturally um, correct. And so these are a lot of my non-biological children that I've had over time, but I wanted to leave you with this last slide which shows um, different books if you're interested in learning more about the uranium issues out on Navajo. So with that, um, I thank you and hopefully we have enough time for some questions. Uh, Mary Beth, you're muted. Thank you. thank you for telling me that. So um, I want to say thank you to both Danny and Inu. So either use your reactions or a round of applause for wherever you are. So thank you so much for um, your presentations. Um, I think we can do questions um, if someone wants to ask one. Uh, if you could either put it into the chat or um, you can also, there's a raise your hand function. It might, because we might have just enough people that it might be a little too unruly to have just people start speaking. So um, there's a raise your hand if you go over to the participants too that we can look at. So either put it into the chat or raise your hand. And Let me ask one question because uh, if we look at uh, uranium, I mean, we're going to find much more uranium in the bone. Uh, have you looked into soups that perhaps that they use with uh, uh, mutant bone? Yes, yeah, so we've done, we've looked at the bone itself. Bone is really hard to do the um, analysis. There's just so much calcium, it's a problem, but we've done some of that. So you're right, bone is where you have collection. And then we have looked at leaching essentially in stews because that's a very important um, part of the Navajo diet. Um, and we compared it actually to looking at um, the same sort of rib meat type um, with the bone present, um, frying it, boiling it, which would be the soup, um, grilling it and roasting it. And it does seem like you do see more in the soup. We're still trying to parse that out, 
but it does seem like he, the others were sort of at the same levels with the, with the soup being at a higher level. So we want to make sure that we didn't introduce anything with the water that we used and other things, but that does seem to be perhaps a concern, which is not good news, just because that's, that's a very typical way to feed a lot of people out on that hill. Um, Dr. Chief. Thank you for that excellent presentation to both Anu Yak and Jenny. Um, my question was to Jenny um, for the analysis of the juniper ash. Um, what, how did you analyze that? Did you separate the, um, the berries from the actual stem and then just look at the leaves itself or there was it all together and would you if you were to separate it where would you think would be the highest amount of calcium so um let me share really quick if i can do this put over here um so i didn't put that one up <laughs> but if you see looking here this was just the juniper berries and then the red is just the branch. And so the branches have a bit more, but it's not an, a lot more. And then most of the, the ashing that he did though was um, all together because he, he thought that the, the grandma that he was working with, that's how they typically do it. So you do see a little bit more in the branch than the berries itself, but um, the, at the same time, it's not, you know, it, it's not a lot. Oh, did I not share that? Sorry. Can you see it now? No, it's on there, yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, so he actually did that work as well. So we have a question. Um, thank you both for presentations. Are the CA levels you see ash samples and the amounts of foods consumed high enough without inputs from blue corn to support bone health in the elders? So that's, that's why we want to look at the blue corn to see if we also have calcium and then to kind of tr start thinking about equivalents of, you know, what the calcium daily requirement is. So, but my understanding is, I mean, because it's so easy to both chew and digest that you know many senior citizen homes have blue corn mush every day for their folks so it's a very prevalent um uh food and so but we have we need to understand where if there's um, very much uh calcium in the blue corn thanks um so uh nor johnson has a question for in new, um, what questions and concerns have Inuit raised about contaminants in country food? How have their questions influenced your next areas for research in your doctoral program? Thanks for the question, Noor. Um, yeah, so there were concerns about um, mercury mostly, and that's kind of a recurring contaminant that we're hearing about even right now in my doctoral program, we're looking at beluga. And um, so mercury seems to be the most, um, I guess that's what you are worried about right now is mercury. And uh, we did, we looked at mercury in my seals um, though, and we looked at total mercury and also methylmercury. And we, we, what we found is what we were expecting and that um, muscle doesn't have that much um, mercury compared to say the liver um, but people are eating the liver um, and they're also eating the meat but we did not look at blubber um, and people eat a lot of seal blubber um, so much so that they eat it with other dishes so if I were to continue with ring seals I would look at um, mercury and blubber so that kind of influenced future directions of research um, yeah. So 
So we have um, some comments. Um, Carol said, interesting about the berries. The grandmas I know do not include the berries for the most part. It's the juniper and cedar that has some red rust color on it on it that they prefer. Um, Fort Defiance and Kenyon Deche um, areas. So the family community differences even with ash. And then um, Dr. Chief commented that at the hospital, they don't serve blue corn mush with ash, but she asked when they served it in her room. And then Susan um, had a question for Jani. Is it known what the path of contamination of the sheep is, water, or what the sheep eat? So that's a good question. Um, we have looked at um, unregulated or livestock wells out on Navajo. So it just depends on the well that the sheep are drawing their water from. And then definitely we've looked at plants. Um, and this is still ongoing, but if the soils are higher in the uranium, then the plants tend to be higher. Um, at least on the Cameron side, there's a grass that we looked at, and unfortunately, the uranium accumulated more in the shoots, so in the top, than they did in the roots, which a lot of times the metals will accumulate in the roots, and so unless the animal is really pulling all the way down to the roots, it's, it's not too bad. So, um, but I think it's a combination. I don't think it's a simple answer. Thank you. Um, and then Hannah says, thank you for the excellent presentations. Uh, Janie, did you analyze the juniper for other nutrients in addition to calcium or any potential toxins, contaminants like PAHs um, from the process making the ash? No, we just looked at calcium. Um, but it would be interesting. We were going to try and work with a biologist to look at some of the proteins in corn because I guess there's a possibility that even the corn would play a role in terms of uh, bioavailability, but we haven't connected on that study. So hopefully, hopefully we can learn more about it. Uh, Nora has another question. Um, is for both Jani and Inu. In new, um, if there is a time for more than one question. Oh, um, Inu in the Arctic. Um, I know there's a lot of concern with long-range transport of contaminants. Are there local sources of contaminants that are also a concern? And then Jani, are there any concerns about long-range transport in Navajo or just locally sourced contaminants? Do you want me to go first? Sure. sure. Okay. <laughs> um, local sources, yeah, there's, so we don't have very good um, sewage systems. So they do leak quite a bit into the ocean and a lot of people will be fishing or harvesting um, shellfish close to the towns. So that is, I think the biggest local source of pollutants but there are i know in north baffin island we have an iron mine up there um and there's a lot of shipping so there the main concern there is um ship noise for local um disturbance yeah, yeah. So on Navajo, besides the legacy uranium mining, there's current coal mining. So there's issues with respect to that. Although we have done a little bit of work looking for mercury in different types of samples and haven't seen high levels or, or levels of the background. The other thing is there's also oil and gas that's particularly in the northern part of Navajo. And so there is definitely concerns about organics there. Um, my group doesn't do organic, so we haven't done a whole lot of sampling there. But there's certainly other contributions to um, some of the, the, the contaminants that folks are um, concerned about. Great, thank you. Um, Carol Heck for a question. For Navajo, arsenic is also a concern. Is that on the horizon for your research? Actually, we do a lot of arsenic. And, and quite honestly, particularly in these unregulated livestock wells, it's probably a bigger concern than uranium. We've seen it in, um, you know, as in the wells that we've sampled, that which are more on the western side of Navajo, is 30, 40% of the wells have elevated levels of arsenic. So yeah, that is definitely something that my lab looks at a lot. 
And so, um, Dr. Chief, to follow up with Carol, our arsenic is linked to diabetes. Um, did your survey present um, percentage people add sugar to their blue corn mush? So we haven't done any surveying on the eating of blue corn mush, which would probably be a good thing. Uh, mostly we look at, we've done the mutton consumption survey. So that's something we should probably look at. I know for myself, I add sugar. So <laughs> it, it's pretty tasty that way, but I know that's, that just adds to the calorie count if nothing else. Are there more questions? I had a question um, for both of you to answer uh, about working with the with the tribal governments or the First Nation governments. Is this something that they're part of the project or did you present? I know you talked about presenting like the video in new. Um, is there something more or something that they're interested in working with and collaborating you with? Yeah, so for Nunavut, um, we have to get approval from uh, Nunavut Research Institute. And you also have to have local approval through the hunters and trappers organizations. So in most cases now, research won't get funding if you do not have the hunters and trappers support. Um, so there's quite, there's like the local organization and then there's the regional organization because um, Nunavut's split into three regions and it's different for like uh, Northwest Territories has its own set of organizations too, but yeah, there's, there's quite a few. <laughs> yeah, and on, on our side, definitely, the, especially the mutton, the livestock work has been a huge push from the community, asking that question if there's uranium in our mutton. Um, but that new Cove project actually is, it's funded through EPA, but it's actually from a settlement from a uranium company to the Navajo Nation. And the community was asked, you know, what do you want this funding to go toward? And they were very interested in um, uranium levels in Cove in their livestock. So that's why we also are looking at goats. And we are, are looking at cattle. Cattle are very different. Cattle are more of a, a, a cash crop, so to speak, for those folks. So we're also, going to be collaring cattle and seeing where they graze and see if they're being exposed. So yeah, but it's it, in order to do this, particularly the livestock work, if the community is not engaged and working with you, it, I don't see how you could accomplish it. So it's very important. Great. Thank you both. Any more questions? So it doesn't look like there's any more questions. So thank you once again for both to both of you for presenting um, and for sharing your work and taking the time today. Very much appreciated. So uh, another round of applause. Yay. <laughs> thank you so much. I do really appreciate and learned a lot. So and thank you for all of you who attended. Um, we do plan on um, putting the recording up on the IFKIN website, which is IFKN dot org and i think we're also looking at putting it i think either the super fund or other site will have it too so the center so look for it there all right thank you